Phase one deal that was three years in the making. An 86-page agreement so comprehensive that it includes a vow from China to buy scandium, a rare earth material used for missile guidance systems that, get this, the U.S. does not have. <laughs> so will Beijing's promise to import the material, not mined anywhere in the U.S., be just as likely to come true as every other part of this deal? Stefan Selig, who served as Under Secretary of Commerce for International Trade under President Obama, joins us now to give us his take. Stefan is the founder and managing partner at Bridge Park Advisor. So we're being a little tongue in cheek there, maybe a little bit cynical. But as Romain asked, is this trade deal a commitment or a target? Uh, I think it's both. And I think, um, look, beside the tongue in cheek comment, Scarlett, uh, the administration does deserve some real credit. Um, there is some real progress um, that past administrations. Um, have not made in terms of advancing our trade relationship with China. And what it will fundamentally do is relax some of the uncertainty in the market and quell some of the fears that this was going to escalate further. So there are some real positives. On the other hand, I do think we have to have a balanced view of what was actually accomplished because the big issues were not attacked. And those big issues obviously relate to state subsidies of local businesses and SOEs and actually real market access. So I would give it an incomplete. Okay. So, I mean, on this show, I mean, we kind of talk in the big macro picture stuff, but there's been a lot of good Bloomberg reporting over the last year that have shown uh, just a lot of anecdotal evidence and even data evidence of small and mid-sized businesses, farms, really sort of being hurt uh, by this prolonged uh, trade war. So did what we get today, was that worth it? And are some of the losses or some of the pain that some of these businesses have felt, is that going to be rectified, say, I don't know, over the next year? So that is the multi-billion dollar question, mm -hmm. Romain, which is, was the light worth the candle? Mm -hmm. And it is not just increased prices to consumers. It's not just lower profits to businesses that you referenced, but it was also $28 billion of farm aid, mm -hmm. farmers feeling the pain, farm debt high, uncertainty in the markets, foreign direct investment going down. And that foreign direct, direct investment is so important to actual U.S. employment um, and employee and jobs that are traditionally very highly paying. So there have been some real costs. And the question is, what did we get for these tariffs that have been put in place and this three years of drama? So the math part, the phase one, is, is very numerical based, as we've been talking about specific, specific commodity, tar commodity import targets, some that we don't even apparently have. The, uh, ways that China and the U.S. do business with each other. That's the, everyone knows, the more difficult part, uh, save for phase two, things like tech transfer and cybersecurity and all those kinds of things like that. Is there any reason to think, based on phase one and based on what you've heard today, that will actually solve those true thornier issues? Well, I think there's two questions, Joe, is will we get there and when might we get there? I think given the amount of time that it got, that it took to get these more modest accommodations right. accomplished three years with a lot of drama. I think it is highly unlikely we get that, certainly um, during the pendency of this administration. And don't forget, the things that are left to do that theoretically would be in phase two or phase three really are at the heart of the Chinese economy right. and the Chinese Communist Party, which is the state control of their economy. And this raises the question, which is really, how is the largest market economy in the world, the United States, going to coexist over a long period of time with the largest non-market economy that is growing, which is China. And there is no precedent for that. And I don't think we've figured it out. And the timetable to figuring that out clearly is uncertain. Yeah, it's a work in progress, clearly. Um, today's news conference was really remarkable. The president talking for about 40 minutes before he gave way to Liu He, the vice premier of China. Let's listen to what Liu He said. In that spirit, I hope the U.S. side will treat fairly Chinese companies and their regular trade and investment activities and give support to the collaboration between enterprises, research institutes, and schools and colleges of the two countries, as it will help enhance mutual trust and cooperation between us. Obviously, that was a translator for Vice Premier Liu He. I look at what happened there, and the optics were kind of strange because there was a lot of discussion in the lead up to the signing of phase one on where it would be signed, whether uh, they would do it in a neutral country, when the presidents met. In the end, it was in the White House, and Xi Jinping did not show up, and Jimmy Chang of Rockefeller was on with us earlier. He said he was checking Chinese websites. There's no mention of the trade deal whatsoever. Mm. Is China downplaying this? Is this less important to China than it is to the U.S.? 
Well, I think, Scarlett, that really raises the question about how much there is there. Mm -hmm. And I think from the Chinese perspective, they didn't get very much. So they got some relaxation of tariffs and some of these tariffs that were being threatened to be put in, not put into place. So they can't really go home and talk about a victory of things that they got on the one hand. On the other hand, they have free access to our economy. So there weren't a lot of things that we had to give to them. And so I think they're going to naturally downplay this agreement. And on the other hand, I think, frankly, a lot of the majesty you're seeing uh, in the White House is really more of a political show sure. than right. it is actually a true economic and commercial show. So, I mean, there's a lot we can pick apart out of this report, 90-something pages, uh, last count, 94, I believe. I mean, there was this uh, provision in here allowing financial companies uh, greater access to the Chinese market, and we saw Visa, MasterCard, and a couple yep. of companies like that. So there were some tangible things in here that will have some sort of immediate impact, right? For, for sure. The yeah. question, Romain, is a lot of those things have been discussed for a very, very long time. Mm -hmm. And a lot of those things are actually in the best interest of China. And mm -hmm. so the question, my hmm. question to you before was, what might we have accomplished to achieve many of these goals without the costs that our yeah. economy and our workers have had to suffer over the last three years? I think that's a really interesting point and something that gets lost in this when you say some of these things are in the best interest of China. Do we risk falling into a trap where we start to think that all trade agreements are zero sum? Because certainly the president sees trade that way. He frames the agreements that way. He's like, yeah, look, China's going to get the best that they wanted. I blame my predecessors for not having a good trade agreement. And are we losing sight of this idea that in theory, anyway, free trade should benefit both sides? The definition of trade, it is not a zero sum game. Right. We would not trade with each other if we were not both better off, mm -hmm. period, full stop. And that really is one of the fallacies of this. I would also say that focusing on the Chinese purchases of U.S. goods and services is also a mistaken notion. Because trade deficits, as we've all known, and you've right. talked about on your show before, are not fundamentally based, yeah. fundamentally based on um, commercial policy and trade policy. They're based on savings rates and consumption and exchange right. rates. And so that shouldn't be the focus. The focus should really be on the fundamental issues of the economy. And, and from that perspective, this is a ceasefire and not a win. Hmm. Very quickly, Stefan, uh, will Peter Navarro be happy with this? Or will this just <laughs> get him riled up even more? <laughs> Uh, I don't know Mr. Navarro, so I can't say. Uh, he is clearly the most hawkish, his chance, yeah. his most hawkish person. What I would say is he has, and even the president has in the past, talked about dealing with these fundamental issues, which phase one does not do.